love. Now celebrate yourselves because you are unusual women. Hallelujah. And God is counting on you for great things. Hallelujah. Now that I have spent about half my time greeting everybody, you can now be seated in God's presence. I'm going to try to do this quickly. Interestingly, God gave me three messages. Two of it have been delivered. So as Pastor Nike was preaching, I was like, what's all this now? Why would I even preach after Pastor Nike? It, it's important for me to preach before her so that she will not be looking for what to preach. Because you see, the problem is we're all taking the message from the same place. <laughs> so if the Holy Spirit has told us the same thing, and she quickly said her own. The second message, Bumi has preached it. So I will look for the third one and preach it. Praise God. Okay, I'm going to read to you a very common scripture, and then I'll take it from there. Father, I ask you today to speak to your daughters and your sons, who somehow will not mind their business. They somehow find themselves in our midst. But Lord, I ask you to bless them as well. Lord, I ask that the words that I speak, you take it and break into a thousand pieces so that everyone in this room gets what is theirs. If you won't speak, I won't speak. So Lord, please speak and let it be very loud. In Jesus' mighty name we've prayed. Amen. So I want to start from John 2. I read from verse 1. I'm going to try to rush it. It's a very common scripture. Um, read mostly at weddings, but for some reason, that's the scripture God gave me this morning for somebody in this house. If you are that person, say amen. amen. It says, on the third day, there was a wedding at Cana of Galilee, and the mother of Jesus was there. And Jesus also was invited with his disciples to the wedding. And when the wine was all gone, the mother of Jesus said to him, they have no more wine. And Jesus said to her, Dear woman, what is that to you and to me? What do we have in common? Leave it to me. He says, my time, my hour to act has not yet come. And his mother said to the servants, whatever he says to you, do it. Now, there were six water pots of stone standing there as the Jewish custom of purification, demanding, holding 20 to 30 gallons apiece. And Jesus said to them, pay attention. He says, fill the water pots with water so that they, have, that they filled them up to the brim. Then he said to them, draw some out now and take it to the manager of the feast, to the one presiding, the superintendent of the banquet. So they took him some, and when the manager tasted the water, just now turned into wine, not knowing where it came from, though the servants had drawn the water, they knew. He called the bridegroom and he said to him, everyone else serves his best wine first. And when people have drunk freely, then he serves that which is not so good. But you have kept back the good wine until now. And they said, this, the first of his signs, miracles, wonder works, Jesus performed in Cana of Galilee and manifested his glory. By it, he displayed his greatness and his power openly. And his disciples believed in him, adhered to, trusted in, and relied on him. Now, this is a very common scripture. Most times you hear it at weddings. In fact, it was the message that was preached at my wedding, the scripture that was read at my wedding. And what this scripture tells me, number one, is that Jesus specializes in doing unusual things. First of all, if you have a ministry, usually your first miracle should be in church. Abby? Jesus should have gone to the synagogue to go and perform miracle so that they would know that he's the son of God. But he went to a wedding. He went to an ordinary place. And you see, this is what I love about Jesus. The fact that he uses the foolish things of this world to confound the wise. Nobody saw it coming. Nobody dreamt that the first miracle that the Messiah, the son of God would do would be at a wedding. But I know that God is very intentional. So he went to start where Satan thought he ended. Mm. Satan did not appear until the first marriage in the Garden of Eden. Adam was all by himself. Satan did not talk to him. The minute they brought wife for him and he married, Satan appeared. And you see, like I always say, the person that, is play, that you are playing with is not playing with you. Satan is not joking. He's very intentional. So he went there and caused problem. And threw all of us into this problem that we are all in today. And when Jesus was going to start, Jesus started from where Satan thought he had won. He started from a wedding. He went right back to that place. And you see the thing I love about him again? 
is that he likes to do extraordinary things. And that's one thing Pastor Bimbo said this morning about the word unusual. She said it means extraordinary. Why didn't Jesus ask for the small wine they had and multiply it? Why didn't Jesus multiply the remaining wine? Because when Mary called him, when his mother called him, she said they're about to run out of wine. So the wine had not run out. So he could have easily said, okay, bring what you have. Let me multiply it. No, he likes to do extraordinary things. He likes to do unusual things. That's why I know. I am sure and I know like I know my name that you may think that your life is ordinary, but when Jesus is done with you, I said when Jesus is done with you, your life will never remain the same. He didn't turn bad wine to good wine. He turned water to wine. He took the ordinary and made it extraordinary. Listen, there is nothing that God cannot use. I know that a lot of us sometimes think, hmm, what do I have to offer? I'm not, that, I'm not that eloquent. I'm not that intelligent. I'm not that prayerful. I'm not that deep. Listen, God would take anybody who is available and use for his glory. I'll tell you a little bit about myself. I was born into a family of six children. I'm not the first girl, I'm not the last girl. I'm not the first one, I'm not the last one. I'm not even the middle child. What does that tell you? That tells you that I was most likely the child who was least noticed. Now, the second issue was that I was a fat child. So I had aunties who consistently called me Isioma a Greek. Oh, and in case you don't know what that is, because when they called me Isyama Greek the first time, I looked confused. Then my auntie tried to explain it to me. Oh, Isyama a Greek fowl. Meaning, you know, a Greek fowl. It's not like native fowl. Native fowl is, is thin. A Greek fowl. So as I'm coming, they'll say, hey, or And she'll be fine, girl, over she fat. So I heard this over and over again. First of all, I didn't have a position. Secondly, I was fat. Then I became shy extremely shy. What that also meant was that it affected my confidence in school. I was intelligent, but I would never offer the answers. So I, was, I would likely know the answer, but I would never speak up. One day I tried to brave it, and we did a test, and it was an English test, and my mom was an English teacher. So sometimes you will hear the English teacher come out, but the worry in me will not allow us to be great. Um, so sometimes you will hear the corona come out, um, but great affair will not allow me to actually be great. So, <laughs> so I did this test, and it was a written test, thankfully. And so they were handing out the, the papers. You know how they will hand out papers? But they will hand it out according to grades. So they were handing out the worst to the best. And so they were handing people's own out. I mean, I was sitting in the class, and I would sit in the middle. Um, and so they were handing out the test scripts. And then eventually, um, my teacher finished handing out everybody's own and, and handed my own last and said to me, I want you to come out and read your script because it was so good. It was an essay. And so I came out shaking, really shaking, like I couldn't even stand in front of my classmates to read the script. And I stood there and I was reading. And let me tell you the funny thing. I was very loved as a child. So it had nothing to do with my parents. It had everything to do with Satan. So that's what I'm telling you. Satan is intentional. And you know why he's intentional? He knew where I was going. He knew that I would need that confidence to be able to preach the gospel. So he started attacking it from when I was young. And so I finished reading. And the woman said to me, and you speak beautifully. What is wrong with you? And one boy at the back shouted, uh-uh, but she's just a girl now. And then it occurred to me that being a girl meant there was something wrong with me. So I added that to my list. And you see a lot of people were walking about with baggage. And that's why I said, all my message was preached this morning. I was just, you heard me when she said, I said, this girl is preaching my message. I will deal with her later, but, but for the love of God. <laughs> no matter what you think you've been through, no matter what you think you have, let me tell you, God will use you if you will let him. That's why, like she said, I'm very fond of saying nothing is off limits to God. Because everything I have handed to him, he has made it extraordinary. Everything. So, remember, no family position, fat, shy, girl, sickly. I forgot to add that. I was very sickly as a child. I was asthmatic. Um, 
Typhoid and malaria was normal. I was in a coma for seven days because of typhoid. So at some, like every single, the attack was from everywhere. And then I was bullied a lot growing up. Now, Satan tried to do all these things, like I said, because he knew where God was going with me. And let me tell you the truth. Every single one of you in this room, God has a plan and a purpose for your life. Now, you must understand that God does not always do ordinary things. So as unusual as your life may seem, God will still use it if you will place it in his hands. The things that God will use to give you platform will blow your mind. How did I know about Bumi? I knew about her because of Shredder. Probably if she hadn't been so big, she may not have started Shredder Gang. And it has given her platform such that anytime you come to her, she will put Jesus down your throat before you even say anything to her. So what Satan meant for evil, God will always turn it around for good. That's a good thing to celebrate God right there. So there are three things that will help you. I'm going to try and rush because I don't have time at all. There are three things that will help you if you are going to be unusual and be comfortable with being unusual. Number one, you have to be authentic. You have to be okay with being you. In fact, I don't even know... I don't even know what other option there is really because every other person is taken. You can only be you. And there's nothing wrong with you. Anyone fatter than you is too fat. Anyone slimmer than you is too slim. Anyone taller than you is too tall. Anyone shorter than you is too short for the assignment that God has sent you. You know, I used to really worry. When I first got married, I used to worry about I'm not pastor's wife material. I told my husband when he proposed to me. I said, I'm not pastor's wife material. Why? Because I had this image of pastor's wives being very soft-spoken. You don't, even if you offend them, they just go, bless you, bless you. They wear big hearts. They sit beside their husband and they just be smiling. Anything that's happening, they're smiling. Um, they sit beside their husband during meetings. I say, as daddy said, you know, all those things. I had, honestly, that's what I thought. I was, not a camp, I was not a pastor's girlfriend on campus. I didn't have pastor's wife training. I didn't have any of those things. I was an ordinary girl. Ordinary girl that had her own issues in church. Sometimes they say, don't do this one, we do it. I was a normal kid. Do you understand? So, when my husband came with, I love you, I said, my brother, don't over love you. There are many issues to consider. Number one, I'm not a pastor's wife. If somebody do me nonsense, I go to camp for church. Oh. I know they do that type. Oh. My husband will say, uh, is that, it's just that, that, that dose of fire in you that God needs. I say, hey. we are saying in uh, Zin Love I to say, not that tomorrow church member will report me, you will be angry. <clears throat> I say, number two, you are loving me, you are loving me. Doctor said, I know if he born, no. So are you still in love? He said, who said that? The word of God. I say, let the word of God still remain the love the word of God when we enter marriage. <laughs> so I honestly thought that I wouldn't be, and I, and I do not sit in one place. I don't know what to do. Oh, don't worry, man. Let me carry your Bible. It's not heavy. My Bible is not heavy. So I don't understand the unnecessary work. Why are we putting effort where there's no need for effort? If I come into church and somewhere is dirty, I will clean it. I don't know what to do, mama. So you come to church, you may not know I'm pastor's wife, oh, because I'm probably in children's church carrying baby because there's nobody to carry baby. So I was, I'm, I'm too active for that. I was raised like that. So, and I felt... This thing will affect the church. But do you know, one of the things God said to me, and that's why I say if you hand it to him, one of the things God said to me, and I want you to write it down and remember it. He said, I made you this way because I need you this way for this assignment. So exactly that thing you are complaining about, that thing you are complaining about is exactly what God wants to use. I always felt, you know, you have to be, when you're preaching, you have to be eloquent. You have to be, you know, put together, you know, and, and do the Hebrew and the Greek and, the, you know, explain things to people and use examples that are far from your, your personal life because you have to, me. If something do me for money, I go use and preach for afternoon, no. I don't have secrets, so. <laughs> You know, so I, I just felt all this packaging, packaging that is killing people's lives. I'm like, I can't do this, Lord. But do you know that it's those, that authenticity? That is the amazing thing that makes people, every time I meet people, they say, well, I'm inspired by you. And I'm really thinking, I'm not really doing anything. I'm just being myself. There's nothing I'm doing. I'm not thinking, I'm not even thinking about it. A lot of times when I come up at 3 p.m., Chisom is here, my PA. A lot of times when I come up at 3 p.m., just before I go up, I tell her, 
She said, I don't have anything to say. She said, that's the type we like, man. She'll just put on live. And I just flow. You know why? Because I'm not acting. Be your authentic self. If you're going to be, if you're going to be unusual and be successful, be yourself. There's nothing wrong with you. God made you this way because he needs you this way for this assignment. Tell your neighbor that. Say, God made you this way because he needs you this way for this assignment. The second thing that you're going to need if you're going to be great at being you or be the best you is you're going to need audacity. So the first thing, you need to be authentic, authenticity. The second thing, you need audacity. You need to be bold enough to be you. You need to be bold enough. Even when the world is being, going the opposite direction, you have to be okay with being you and not be ashamed of it. Don't be ashamed of being a Christian. Don't be ashamed. Me, I wear my Christianity like a badge. I, I'm, I, I won't, why? If you are not ashamed to naked yourself, why should I be ashamed to zip up? Why? You go to a wedding and your slit has slits. And then me, I come in a nice dress. I should be ashamed? No. If you are smoking on the road and you don't put it out when you see me, why should I be praying in tongues and keep quiet when you are passing me? No. Ladies say enough is enough. Because these days, it's becoming intimidating to be a Christian. So they tell you you have to be politically correct. Let me tell you, you have to be careful about being politically correct and being spiritually wrong. What does the Bible say? That's what we say. That's what we stand for. And you have to own it with your full chest. The third thing, you have to live for an audience of one. I'm consistently on flint mode. Read Isaiah 50 verse 7. It says, because the Lord will help me, I know I will not be ashamed. So I have set my face like a flint. A flint is a stone, a hard stone. That when it comes against anything to cause sparks, that means that you are not afraid to be controversial. You are not afraid. Me, I say my mind with my full chest. Last, last, you go curse me. Or you write about me on social media. And me too, I'll come back on social media and answer you. Last, last, one of us go need social media. And it is social. It doesn't belong to you. Ah. So we have to be intentional. These people are trying to... See, we have to be intentional about what we do. I was watching uh, an ad the other day. Uh, one of these popular I do, chocolate bars or something. And they, 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 they were doing an advert about being transgender. Another one about... The, I, Different things. It's the children that are getting old. The advert did not have message. You know, it's how Satan is now doing. He's not, he's not even hiding himself again. Before, Satan used to hide. He used to do it while men slept. Now, while men are awake, Satan will just come and just say, you know what, I need like three of their children from Global Impact. I want her own, I want her. And you, you are saying, hey, let's not say, we don't know, we don't want people to be offended. Let them be offended. Let them be offended. Because it's only Jesus we're living for. If you're going to stand out, if you're going to be the best you you can be, you have to be okay with people not being pleased with you. It's okay. But if a man's ways please the Lord, he makes even his enemies to be at peace with him. So they will try, but they can't succeed. They will try everything, but they can't bring you down. They can't. As far as your way pleases God, not that you have bad character. He said, my way pleases God. That's bad character. There's a difference. <laughs> So living for an audience of one. And let me tell you the three things that, that will happen when you decide to do this. Number one, Satan will come for your hand. What does that mean? He will attack what you can do. He said to Nehemiah, I don't have time, so I'm not going to read all the scriptures. Nehemiah decided to rebuild the walls of Jerusalem. And he came back and gathered his people and he came. And as he was building, Satan came through Sambalat and Tobias. And let me tell you, the enemy is the same. His agents change. So that's why the Bible says that we wrestle not against flesh and blood. So it's not your husband that is your enemy. It's the voice behind him that is the enemy. So don't be fighting your husband. You're on the same side. See, that's just deceiving you. So they came to him and they said, what's this thing that you are building? That even if a dog should climb on top of it, it will scatter. What's this? Neymar did not answer them all. He said, why should I come down to answer you? Why should the work stop? He said, I'm not going to come down to answer you. So let people be talking. Let them be criticizing what you are doing. Keep doing it. Keep doing it. Keep at it. The second thing he will come for, he will come for your head. 
when I talk about your head, he will come for your identity. He will make you question everything. Am I really sure? Will people listen to me? Ah, if I write the book, will people buy? If I start the business, will they patronize me? Start first now. Write the book first now. You have not even written book. You have already started talking about whether they will buy it. It's not a book that is available they will buy. First start. God is looking for women. And I'm trusting God that as I've come here today, I've come to raise those women. Women who are comfortable with being unusual. Women who understand that being unusual means that they are willing to please God at any cost. And they are going to be vocal about it. So he will come for you. He will come for your identity. He will come to you like Eve. He will say, did, did God really say? Did God really say that you are going to go to nations? Did God really say that, Bridget, when you sing, your voice will enter into nations, your feet will never enter? He will question you. Your husband is annoying you. Did God really say you should marry this man? You've been trusting God for children. Did God really say that you will have children? Satan asked me this question many years. It took me eight years to have my first biological child. He asked me this question on a daily basis. Did God really say? He's trying to get you to hit at God's integrity. And that's what would destroy your identity. And you see, let me also share this with you. Because I notice a lot of people think that when they are going through tough times, it means God is not with them. That's a big lie. That's a big lie. When Jesus was baptized, immediately he came out of the water. The Bible tells us that heavens were open and a voice came from heaven and said, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. Hear ye him. God validated him. The very next line, if you read your Bible very closely, is that the Spirit of God took him into the wilderness to be tempted. Why did the Spirit of God take him to the synagogue to be exalted? He took him to the wilderness, a place of extremes, where it is either too hot or too cold. That's a difficult place to be. He didn't take him to a place of peace. He took him to a controversial place. And he put him there so that he will be tempted by Satan. How can you send me into Satan? Sir, you just said I'm your son, sir. It's not really making sense, Lord. And so when we're going through difficult times, we sometimes think God is not there. No. God sent you there because he knows you have the ability to defeat that situation. And when you come out of it, you will encourage other people. So don't let Satan lie to you. That the way you are feeling, that means God is not with you. That's a big lie. The third thing that he will attack is your heart. Oh, and, and I'm not even going to bother because Bumi did an amazing job this morning. In fact, she shredded it. But don't leave me, whatever. <laughs> your heart, and I say this all the time, the heart of the matter is always a matter of the heart. Satan is not after anything but your heart. If he can get your heart to be offended, the first thing he would throw is offense. Yes, you have daddy issues. Forgive your daddy. Your friends left you, forgive them. They betrayed you, forgive them. Your husband cheated on you, forgive him. Why? For your heart. For your heart. Don't let your heart be callous. Your heart. Fight for your heart. Because out of it are the issues of life. Fight for your heart. It's your heart you hear God through. You don't hear God here. It's your heart. If your heart is hardened, you can't hear God. And if you can't hear God, what kind of a life is that? You want to struggle? So guard your heart. He will come with offense. Jesus said, blessed is he who is not offended in me. And one of the things that helps me every time when it comes to offense is the fact that I wait alongside eternity. When Jesus comes now, will he matter? Somebody stole your money. Jesus come, will he matter? When Jesus comes, is he money? If I, you better not be here. Is it money we are talking about? You better have raptured. Because money is not going to be your issue at that time. Your husband cheated on you. Is there marriage in heaven? When Jesus comes now, will we not go to heaven and forget? This mansion may not even be near your own. So you may not see heaven. If I talk now, they start to talk. Wait along inside eternity and you will see that it doesn't matter. At the end of the day, it doesn't matter. So it takes me back to my story and that's when I'm going to end. So Jesus was at that wedding. And from that story, God showed me four things 
that will help you. If you can have those four things in your life, you will be the best to you and you will be comfortable with being unusual. So the very first thing was when Jesus said to his mother, he said, what is it to me that they don't have one? He said, my time has not yet come. Amplify says, my time to act has not yet come. One of the things that will help you to be your best use is to understand timing. There are timings and there are seasons to everything. There's a timing for preparation. And then there's a timing to be exposed. It will just take one little thing for God to bring you out. But are you ready to be brought out? You are trying to build a business and you say you want one billion customers. Can you handle one billion customers? Or will it take your soul? Timing. Jesus said, it's not yet my time. But he told her, leave it to me. He checked it. He said, it's not my time. There's a time for preparation. And you see that time of preparation, take advantage of it. Serve. There's, that's a word this generation don't understand anymore. Serve. Growing up, well, we always had aunties in my house who were serving. They would come there to serve, learn how to take care of children, learn how to cook, and they would go to their husband's house and it would be easy. Now, even to walk, you walk with somebody two months, what does she even do? It's not a meal plan. Meal plan. And, and she has written that meal plan. You see the amount of money she's raking in. Now, you know, I just come here two weeks, I they go. I'm going to start my own. I will start shredded team. They will leave and think that they will steal your customers. Let me tell you, it is grace that is making it work. And because you are under that grace, you think it is easy. It's not easy, it's grace that is making it look easy. Just because she does it well doesn't mean it's not heavy. Just because she does it well doesn't mean it's not hard. What's even Pastor Vimba even doing? It's not to rent hall and now gather women. It's not to gather women and to sell t-shirts. Uh-uh. What's she even doing, Seth? That I cannot do. And I've been with her two months now. Let me tell you, she doesn't do anything. No. Even prayer like that, we're the ones that pray. <laughs> His grace. He's, I'm a pastor's wife, I've had things. I've had things. When you wear shoes like that, they say, that looks like my tight. That left leg, that's my tight. <laughs> but I know global impact, you are not like that. <laughs> Understand timing. And in that time, you understand that there must be preparation. Jesus said, my time has not yet come. Because he knew that he needed to be prepared before he was released to the world. The second thing, Mary said something profound. She said, whatever he tells you to do, do it. If you are going to be the best you, you must understand obedience. Total, unreserved obedience. If Jesus tells you to jump, don't ask any stupid question. Just say, Lord, how high? And be jumping till he says, stop. You can't know more than God. Sometimes when people use their intellect and they're saying, oh, you know, um, I've searched the scriptures. You didn't really tell Abraham to jump. You didn't tell um, Mordecai. You didn't tell, what, what English are you speaking? Are you Abraham? Are you Mordecai? Everybody has their personal work with God. If you can hear the voice of God and you can ascertain that it is the voice of God, you better obey what God is saying. So your friends want to go out. You have planned that party and they've all decided they are going to be naked to that wedding. And he says, my child, if you naked that naked, I will naked you. I will naked you. My, I mean, my time is almost up, but I, let me share this story. I was, in a, I was, um, I was at my pastor's, my family's um, 25 year anniversary. So one, one of them, a bishop came to preach there. And he shared this story. And every time, every, I can't get over that story to tomorrow. He shared the story of how he went to preach in America. And he had never been to America. He says, so when he got there, God had given him what to preach. Oh, when he got there, the announced started introducing him. This bishop, he's a bishop of many churches. He's a bishop of this. He, what he speaks, he started praising him. He said, they were praising him. I was like, ah, see the expectation. He says, so when he got there, they gave him the mic. He took the mic. He said, he lifted the mic like this. He said, God. <laughs> he said, he just heard the Holy Spirit. He said, I would disgrace you here. <laughs> he said, me, God. Me. <laughs> he said, he just, he just repented. <laughs> Let me go back to my message. Whatever he tells you, do it all. Don't follow what people owe. It's better for you to be right with God and let the world be angry with you than to be right with the world and let God be angry with you. 
<laughs> ah, because if you are in trouble, who will rescue you? But when the world is talking, you say, the Lord is my light and my salvation. Of whom shall I be afraid? The Lord is the stronghold of my life. Nothing can do you if God is for you. That's the confidence you need to live your life with. Ah, your precious cargo. The day God revealed that thing to me, anywhere you are going, say the host of heaven is backing you up. Do you know what it means to be in covenant with God? God is with you. You are entering a place as if it's only you that is coming. If you, if you can really see, ah, something happened that changed my life when I was in Ife. I was in a prayer meeting. Uh, I was in drama. Even though I couldn't act, but I was in drama. I used to write scripts for them, but I didn't used to act. So I was in drama units, and we were praying that day. And when we were praying, for some reason, I just opened my eyes, and I sensed a very evil presence. We were praying, oh, I sensed a very evil presence. And so I looked around me. I saw, like, some creatures in black around us. And so immediately, I almost, you know, fear now, of course. I, I mean, you, will, you will just sit down. The way people are looking at me as if, oh, that's normal. We see demons every day. What are demons? <laughs> me, I was afraid, oh. So I just grabbed my friend that was beside me, Lulu. I said, Lulu, I'm seeing demons. I said, let's pray. So as they were praying, because we were surrounded like this, the Holy Spirit just said to me, you are looking down. Look up, my child. I raised my head. If you see angels, see, the problem was I could only see them from here down. And I couldn't see them, like, from heaven, from heaven where I could see them. It was their skirt down. Gold sash and the dress. I say, from today, I will never look down again. I was afraid of people who were afraid. Do you, do you know the people that are looking after you? Oh. Covenant. And covenant is activated by obedience. Obedience is what activates covenant. If God knows that you are for him, anything he tells you to do, you do. There's nothing you ask God I won't do for you. The third thing, if you are going to be your best you, the third thing, Jesus said, fill the water pots with water and fill it to the brim. Now, everyone knows that if you're talking about water in Scripture, you're talking about the Word. Fill up your life with the Word of God. See, eh? one of the things that set me free is the day I realized that King James is not the only Bible in the world. <laughs> so, me and my, my, when I got married, though, I joined DCC. When you're preaching, they'll just put King James. I said, I don't, that, I'll be reading that. I said, I don't understand this thing. I just read to you people. Please, is there a message there? They'll put it. I said, I know you put in your mind, you're thinking this one is not so deep. Is it not better for me not to be deep to you, but deep in the things of God? Because I understand what God is saying. So you're reading thou art, but you don't art. You don't even know what's, don't know what's happening. Dying, what's dying? Peraventure, what's peraventure? No, you, what's peraventure? Do you know it? You don't know it now. Well, let's stop deceiving ourselves. So me, I started reading what I could understand. I read NLT. I read CPT. I read Message. I read NCV. I read CV. I almost wrecked myself with buying Bibles until you version came out. I kind of owe that man a seed when I meet him. Every translation in my phone, God. I'll literally be drooling over scriptures when I'm reading. I'm like, Jesus Christ, are you CTPT? My husband's like, what's wrong with you? You're very excited. I say, yes. You know how people say their food is, I'm a wordy. I literally drool over the word. It will change your life. Fill the, your life with the word. You will be okay with being you. You will be okay with doing unusual things because you will see people in the Bible who did unusual things from beginning to end. The last thing, I promised myself I'm not going to take more time. The last thing, Jesus said to them, now draw from that pot and take it to the master, the master of ceremony. If you are going to be your best you, you must be ready to push what you are doing to kings. That's your word. Be ready to take what you are doing to kings. Don't be afraid. They could have said, ah, we should carry water. Hey, I keep asking myself, the person, because when that guy drew that thing, it was water. Hmm. Think about it. Jesus said, fill this pot with water. You filled it with water. Then he said, take this water and go and give it to the master of ceremony. He drew water. He didn't draw wine. What was he thinking as he was going to the master of ceremony, carrying that water? What was he thinking? That's what obedience does. 
Obedience will activate the power of God. It was because of obedience that that thing turned to wine. And when the master of ceremony put it in his mouth, he said, this is the best I've ever tasted. Let me tell you, if you will take your life and obey God by following through on what he says you should do. If God says go to social media, go to social media. If God says go to education, go to education. If God says go to politics, go to politics. If God says raise your children like godly seed, do it with all your heart. Don't be afraid. Do it with everything you have. Being unusual means that you understand that you live for Jesus alone. And anything he says you should do, you do it with all your heart. God is looking for unusual women today. Women who are okay with being great, but being submitted. Women who are okay not to cover up lies. Women who are okay with praying. Because I hear a lot of women complain about, is there only women that pray? Why don't men pray? What's wrong with you praying? Is it competition? Why must everything be gender? Why can't we pray? If men don't want to pray, whose business? Who are you praying to? How can you be... Is it... I don't know. I didn't come here to fight today, so let me face my front. God is looking for women who understand that being unusual means being okay with being an ambassador of Christ. We are not ordinary. Ladies, tell yourself I'm not ordinary. Tell yourself I'm, un I'm extraordinary. Tell yourself I'm unusual. Let me tell you the final thing God said to me as I was coming today. He said to me, when a woman, a woman who is going to live the unusual life must be a woman who understands that others may, but I cannot. Others may decide to cheat, I cannot. Others may decide to steal, I cannot. Others may decide to disrespect their husbands, I cannot. Others may decide not to serve in church, I cannot. Others may decide it's okay, it's fashionable to be naked, I cannot. How many women in the room are ready to say that with me this morning? And I need you to jump with your feet, to your feet with a little bit more energy than that. I want you to begin to pray this morning or this afternoon and say, Lord, I have made up my mind that I'm going to live an extraordinary life. I received the boldness to live for you. I have made up my mind that I will not be ordinary. I will not be ordinary. This is not a time to be tired. I want you to open your mouth and pray for yourself. I'm not saying pray for me. I said pray for yourself. Declare, Satan is not going to be able to convince me to be offended. I will not be offended. I live for eternity. I understand that I am called for greater things. I understand that it's okay to be unusual. I will not be conformed to this world and the way the world operates. I live my life in worship. Everything I do, I lay before the master. I'm not afraid to be branded for Christ. I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. Father, I thank you for your word. I release a boldness to be unusual upon your daughters this morning. In the mighty name of Jesus. If you believe it, I want you to shout I'm unusual. Shout I'm extraordinary. <laughs>